Hey, welcome back. Another Wednesday, another bread. Today I'll show you how to make ciabatta. Now if you watched my previous video on how to make a focaccia, this will be very similar to that. The recipe is basically identical, the only difference is the method. But for those who have never made anything like this before, I can say that it's not very difficult, all you need is a bit of patience and you'll be able to master it. To make this recipe, we'll need to make a pre-ferment, which is basically a portion of your dough that's fermented ahead of time for 12 to 16 hours. But we'll get to that in a minute. Let's start with the equipment that you will need. Well, let me just finish my delicious sandwich here. <laughs> right, let's get to it. You'll need digital scales, because measuring things by volume is too unreliable. You'll need a digital probe to measure the temperature of your water and your final dough, a dough scraper, always handy when baking bread, a thick bottom pan, or a thick bottom tray. You can even use a glass Pyrex dish. Now for proofing our ciabattas, we'll use a kitchen cloth. If you're fancy, you'll have a couche at home. That's like a thick baker's linen that they use in professional bakeries. But for the average home baker, just a kitchen cloth will do. So we'll crease it up and rest the dough in between the creases. Right, so in the evening before, we'll make our pre-ferment. You'll need flour, water and yeast. Make sure your water is about 20 degrees Celsius. If your kitchen is cold, raise it up by 1 to 2 degrees. If it's warm, lower it. Now just mix all your ingredients together and leave them stand on the table for about 12 to 16 hours. You can make a bread like ciabatta or focaccia without using pre-ferment, but you will not have the same flavor or the same texture that a proper bread should have. What the pre-ferment does, it gives the bread the distinct sour note and it also turns the crusts a lot more crusty and that is why putting a little bit more effort into this will yield a much better result trust me now once you mix everything together cover it and just leave it so after a good 12 to 16 hours You'll need, once again, more flour, more water, more yeast and salt, and also plenty of flour for dusting. Make sure your water is about 25 degrees Celsius, and once again, if it's cold in your kitchen, raise it up. If it's warm, lower it. Disperse the yeast in the water, make sure it hydrates and dissolves a little bit. Now grab your poolish and have a look at it. A good way of telling that it's ready is looking at the crease. You see that it started falling back in on itself. It's like a little fermentation valley. <laughs> now you can add your yeasted water and your salt and they give you a good mix. Don't be shy here, get your hands dirty. You want to really mix it up to dissolve any sea salt flakes, as it will be much harder to do later on in the kneading process. So just give it a good mix, and once you're happy with it, add your flour. And once again, keep mixing until you don't have any dry flour left over. Make sure it's nicely hydrated. Once you're happy with that, get your little dough scraper and scrape the sides of the bowl down. Collect all the loose bits of dough and plop it out on your table. And we're ready to start working the gluten. Now comes the fun part. Because this is a high hydration dough, meaning that it has a lot of water in relation to the flour, this will require a slightly different kneading technique called a stretch and fold. Now to make life easier, make sure you have a little bowl of water to hand to wet your hands once in a while to prevent the dough from sticking to it. Now at this point you might think, what the hell am I doing here? This is a soggy mess, this will never become a bread dough. But just keep at it and you will soon see the difference. Now a proper way to stretch and fold is by picking up the dough, slapping it on the table, stretching it towards yourself and folding it over. Wash my hands as I'm doing it. Picking it up from the side, slapping it on the table, stretching it towards myself and folding over and repeating. Once in a while, wet your little scraper and collect all the dough together. You don't want any stray bits sticking around. Now I'm not gonna lie, this will take a while. You're gonna repeat this movement for about 400 times. It may sound like a lot, but it'll take you no more than 10 minutes. 
If you feel that you're struggling, what I suggest to do is just collect the dough in one piece and leave it to sit for five minutes. This will help the gluten develop. And after a little rest, just pick it up again and keep going. After a while, you'll see it becoming a lot smoother, less sticky and more elastic. Just a much more pleasant thing to work with. Give it a few more slaps on the table and we're ready. Now because this dough is quite wet and stretchy, we'll give it a few folds during the proofing stage. This will give the dough additional strength, meaning that it will create extra layers of gluten in the structure and that should prevent it from spreading out too much when proofing or baking. So up until this point, this is basically the same recipe that I used for the focaccia. The only difference now will be that I will not add any olive oil into the bowl. So we'll cover our dough and we'll leave it for 20 minutes. At this point you should measure the temperature of your dough, which I forgot to do. It should be about 25 to 26 degrees. If it's any higher, we'll reduce the time between each fold to 15 minutes. To fold it, you want to wet your hands with water so they don't stick to the dough. And then pick the dough up and pull it towards you so it kind of falls underneath itself. In a sort of a rolling motion. And you want to turn it around and do it from either side. It's like you're rolling it up like a little blanket or something. We'll do this three times every 20 minutes. And once you're happy with that, just cover it and leave it until it's next fold. And now just repeat what you did before. Make sure you don't go too rough on it. You don't want to knock out any fermentation gases. After the second fold, we can preheat our oven to 230 degrees Celsius, no fan, and place our baking vessel in to preheat as well. Twenty minutes later, it's time for our third and final fold. Now, depending on, on the strength of your dough, may, you may want to fold more often with smaller intervals, maybe every 10 minutes or so. So after the last fold and the last 20 minutes rest and proof, you will see that the dough will retain its little folds. That means that the gluten is well developed. Now we're ready to shape it. Make sure you get your little dough scraper and plenty of flour for dusting, because this may get sticky. Dust the surface of your dough, also the sides of the bowl, this will help to release it more easily. And make sure to dust your table generously. Don't worry about having too much flour at this point. Because we are not shaping the dough in the traditional way, meaning that we're not going to fold it anymore, we're just going to cut it into pieces, and that means that we won't fold any more raw flour into the dough itself, there will be just flour on the surface. So tip it out upside down and dust the bottom of the dough as well. I must admit, I didn't use nearly enough flour here. So you'll see me struggling a little bit, but I got there at the end. Now at this point you have two choices. You can either eyeball it, and just cut it into six equal pieces, more or less. Or you can use your scales to weigh the dough out into equal amounts. Once you've cut your dough all the way through, make sure to dust the seams with flour properly to prevent them from sticking back together. Once again, I didn't use nearly enough flour here, but just go at it and don't be shy with it. Once you have finished dividing your dough, you can get your little tea towel and dust it generously with flour. We'll use it to proof our dough on. 
you really want a good layer of flour. There's nothing quite as disappointing as dough sticking to the tea towel. It's absolutely miserable, you don't want that to happen to you. Once you finish dusting, create a little crease. This will help the dough stay upright. If you notice, I had my tea towel on a chopping board. I do this because then it's easier to move around. And if I feel like my dough is proofing too quickly, I can place it in the fridge. Slow it down. So between every couple of pieces of dough, you want to create another crease to prevent them sticking to each other and also to prop them up. Once finished, make sure to dust the tops with flour once again, cover the dough and leave it to proof for 30 minutes. I'll show you two ways of baking your ciabattas. One in a cast iron pot with a lid and the other one just on a flat tray. The cast iron pot will help to retain the steam whilst the dough is baking. This will make it rise up a little bit more. But for ciabattas, it's not 100% necessary especially for home bakers like us. So after about 30 minutes, you'll see that your little ciabattas have puffed up nicely. And you can place them in your baking vessel. And we'll start with the cast iron pot. Now we are proofing them upside down. So when you bake them, you want to flip them once again. Because they are proofing upside down, on the cloth, with a layer of flour, this will give them the distinct look of the ciabatta that you all recognize. The little stripes all over the surface. So bake them 10 minutes with the lid on. And after 10 minutes take your pan out, take the lid off and place them back in the oven and bake them for another 10 minutes. Once they're ready, they'll be nicely golden brown, light, and when you tap them, they should make kind of a hollow sound. You can't really go wrong with baking these. So while I was baking the first batch, I placed the other ciabattas in my fridge so they don't overproof. The coldness of the fridge slows down the yeast activity. As you can see, they have puffed up even more than the previous ones, but that's fine, they're still not overproofed. So for the second batch, we'll just use our baking tray. Once again, make sure it's nice and hot, preheated together with the oven, and place your ciabattas upside down as before. And because we are not covering them while baking, we'll bake them for a little bit shorter time, maybe 18 minutes or so. Now once these are done, you want to let them cool down completely. Otherwise, when you cut them, you will tear them and they will get kind of ruined in the process. I'm pretty happy with the result here. And if you follow this recipe, you should have a pretty good result too. And as always, if you have any questions, write them down in the comments, I'll make sure to answer. And thanks for watching, see you in the next one.